The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. So Preston Lopez, um, MS, is trained as a professional clinical counselor and marriage and family therapist and is now working as a transformational coach based in Southern California. <coughs> he has spent the last 10 years on a personal journey, um, on a personal journey of healing, growth, and training that has led to the development of a uniquely modality of assisting clients in doing deeply transformative work. He's integrated his clinical background with practices of mindfulness, meditation, shadow work, somatic trauma release techniques, and the use of non-ordinary states produced by cannabis to create powerful healing experiences for those who are willing to take the deep dive into their own inner space. Preston is trained in the Vipassana meditation technique and has worked under the tutelage of Dr. Daniel McQueen of Medicinal Mindfulness in Boulder, Colorado. So please give a warm welcome to Preston. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ashley. Um, yeah, I just want to start by thanking you, Ashley, for uh, all the work that you do and have done. Uh, I work under the perspective that community is the best medicine. And so I feel very heavily medicated tonight and uh, really grateful for you uh, providing these spaces and bringing people together. Thank you. So, my name is Preston. I'm a big fan of mindfulness meditation, so I'd like to take a minute or two just to help us ground and get landed. So, I invite you to get comfortable and invite you to close your eyes or leave them open, whatever works best for you. And simply bring your attention to your breath. Noticing the rise and fall of your chest and belly. Beginning to expand your attention to the rest of your body. Taking particular note of any points of tension. And choosing, in this moment, to relax just a little bit more. Letting go of whatever stressors the day may have held and landing fully in this space with these people sharing these breaths. Feel the chair beneath you, the floor beneath your feet as you return fully into this room. And then when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. Great. Thank you so much for being here. It's a real pleasure to be able to share. Why am I here tonight? I'm here tonight to win your approval. I'm here to get you to like me. Because there's a part of me that fears that I have nothing to offer and that if I can stand up here in front of a room full of people that uh, maybe I can prove to myself and to each of you that I do have something to offer and that maybe I'm worthy of love. I'm also here to share with you some exciting ways that I and others are using cannabis within a psychedelic paradigm in order to create powerful, transformative, 
healing journeys for people. Both of those are true. So why do I share the first one, right? This is an example of shadow work, right? I'm a big fan of shadow work. It's a big part of what I do and the way I coach my clients and what I think is so important for doing deeply transformational work. If I keep those needs that I have, right, that deep down in shadow, if they're hidden, and I don't acknowledge them for myself, then I'm, gonna, I'm really going to be looking for, you know, validation. But if I can hold them out in front of me and be conscious and, and aware of them, then I can make intentional, empowered choices. So about a half hour ago, I circled up with some of my closest friends and allies and received love and blessing and was able to be seen. So that I can stand here and more powerfully and in a more present way share with you the message that I want to share about this work that I believe in so deeply. Shadow work and this work that I believe in, as I've been preparing for this talk, like one theme kept coming back and coming back and coming back, and it's that of integration. Integration, right? So those parts of myself that might be difficult to face, that might be really vulnerable, Right? I integrate them into my conscious awareness. I don't try to get over them. I don't try to get rid of them. I just become present to them. And then I can make conscious choices around them. I integrate them. And from a broader perspective, I believe that we are so disassociated so often from our most authentic selves from our human family, from our sense of tribe, and disassociated from the earth itself, our good mother. So integration, I think that's one of the powers that uh, plant medicines and cannabis has to offer us, to help us integrate in a really powerful, beautiful way. So a note on perspective, uh, and I take this and have learned this from Daniel McQueen, who uh, again, as Ashley mentioned, is my coach and mentor. He's based in Denver, Colorado. Really beautiful, profound man. Uh, and he says there's four primary quadrants that we can come from when dealing with uh, psychedelic medicines, plant medicines. It's a spiritual perspective, uh, deeply uh, ritualistic, right? Uh, therapeutic healing, scientific, research-oriented, and recreational and creative. I'm coming primarily from a therapeutic healing perspective, right? My background's as a therapist, uh, and now I work as a coach. Uh, and so I definitely include some spiritual uh, perspectives, and I try to be a consumer of good science, and uh, you may be able to catch me using it recreationally at times, but uh, this is my primary perspective, is that of healing. So, before I talk about the actual work with the medicine, uh, whenever I'm working with a client, I come from this perspective of the hero's journey, which was a term coined uh, by Joseph Campbell. And if you're familiar with his work, you know that Joseph was a student of mythology. And he looked at the various myths across cultures, across uh, societies, across time and he saw this theme of this hero's journey this person you know a character is living their ordinary life is called into some extraordinary experience and then returns and integrates what they learned on that journey I love this quote a hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won So if this is the flow of time, it's a little bit of a diagram of uh, the hero's journey, ordinary state, right? This is our, our lives, our day-to-day -day lives. And when somebody chooses to use a psychedelic medicine, when they choose to work with cannabis in this way, 
right? They experience some call, some, some reason, maybe that's an internal call, maybe it's a circumstantial call, but they want, some, they want something new, something different, some healing, some transformation. They step into this non-ordinary state. And Joseph Campbell talks about there being some sort of ordeal there, a challenge that is overcome, right? Where these lessons are learned. And then there's a return and we step into our back into our ordinary life and where we integrate the lessons that we learned and embody a new way of being. So that is the perspective that I use when, when we're working with these journeys. So the medicine. Right? We're using cannabis. Uh, and we're, we're not using concentrate, we're not using dabs, right? We're just using flour. People are, and, and people are using a higher dose, right? I encourage them to take four to seven hits when we go on one of these journeys and we're uh, diving into these deep spaces. Um, but it's, it's, it's this very humble, beautiful plant. Right? That so many of us are familiar with, but we're, when we use in an intentional uh, perspective, we can create these really powerful experiences. And I just put this chart on here because it's showing how much cannabis is becoming uh, accepted. Right? And there's various degrees where it's recreational, medicinal, and then there's some uh, limited medicinal uses. But the plant is on the march, man. This plant is on the march. We're spreading across the country, and it's exciting to me because, we, because so many of these psychedelic medicines are currently barred, right? They're illegal. We're still living in an age of prohibition. But cannabis is accessible. So the work. Using the non-ordinary states of cannabis to create transformational healing journeys. And what I hear time and time again is that that was so much deeper and went so, so much more powerful than I expected it to be. So, right? And I've heard people say that uh, this medicine took them deeper than, uh, or just as deep as any ayahuasca experience they ever had. People compare it sometimes to MDMA, right? That empathogenic heart opening experience as well. But this begs the question, how, right? Anybody who's ever like puffed and passed knows that they didn't go on a psychedelic journey, right? So how is it that we're creating these experiences with this medicine? So again, we're working within a psychedelic paradigm, right? So we're taking the lessons that started in the 60s uh, and that the ways that these medicines are being used. So we're introducing set, setting, and skill. And those of you who are part of the medicine community know that set and setting are stalwarts, right? They're uh, uh, essential to the work we do. And this is where some people are starting, and myself included, to implement these certain skill sets to help us navigate and really uh, create powerful healing experiences. So a little bit about set and setting. Set has to do with mindset, right? Our intention. What is it we're bringing to the table? And uh, when I'm working with clients, this is where I do a lot of the shadow work, right? We're, we're helping people bring into their conscious awareness uh, things that may have been hidden, may, have, may be under the surface where uh, there needs to be some healing, some transformation and growth. Setting. This is the setting that it takes place in, right? We're not at a festival. We're not, we're not doing this haphazardly. Setting has primarily to do with safety, right? Making sure that the person feels safe, physically safe, emotionally safe. And then we're creating really sacred space by the use of candles and music, evocative music, and uh, sage and palo santo, right? We bring all of this into the experience to really create and set the tone. These are some images from my office, and uh, this is kind of what it looks like when somebody's going on one of these journeys. So now skill. What is the skill set that we're implementing? And this is what I'm doing, right? There's a lot of people doing really cool, exciting things with cannabis now. Yoga and all kinds of different things. Dance, ecstatic dance. Um, these are what I'm, I, I'm working with. Shadow work. Shadow work, again, is like making the unconscious conscious, to borrow from a Freudian term, right? We're, uh, we're identifying parts of ourselves that need this healing and growth. Then we use mindfulness. Then it's after that shadow work, right? In between, that's when a person 
uh, takes the medicine. They lay down, they've got a blindfold on, and they begin the process. So we do mindfulness processes in order to identify in the body where we're storing the tension around those shadows, right? And then any trauma that may be associated with that. And then somatic release of trauma. This is where it's at. This is where it's at. Right? Um, trauma is stored in the body. And we are so often unconscious of it and the ways that it impacts us and the way it has impacted our identity formation. Right? Our ego states. And so, uh, we're engaging in these somatic releases of trauma where sh trauma actually gets shaken out and released from the body. I'll go into each of these in a little more detail. But from this hero journey's perspective, this, uh, that ordeal, right, that challenge that needs to be overcome, it's facing trauma. It's engaging with it and healing it so that it doesn't hold us back. Trauma is so important, I really want to unpack this a little bit. So Peter Levine, I recommend his work to anybody. Really powerful writer, uh, an expert on trauma. He developed a uh, technique called uh, somatic experiencing. And he says that the trauma a traumatic event is defined as an event that causes a long-term dysregulation in the nervous system. Trauma is in the nervous system and body and not in the event. That's essential, it's in the body, okay? That's where trauma is stored. It's not the event itself, right? Because two people may have the same experience and one is traumatized and one is not. Trauma is what's stored in the body. The DSM talks about uh, two key experiences associated with trauma, cognitive avoidance and effective numbing. Cognitive avoidance, I'm not thinking about it. Effective numbing, I'm not feeling it. And then things get pushed into shadow. Trauma is pervasive. Trauma is pervasive. Uh, I like to look at this from a uh, like a social justice perspective, right? We talk about microaggressions, right? Where one little microaggression on its own doesn't really. It's not that big of a deal for a person of minority status to experience a little microaggression. But what happens is that we're inundated with them from all angles, media, well-intending people, right? And it becomes a field in which a person lives and dwells. It's a weight that they have to deal with. I like to liken that to trauma, like to traumatic events, where all of us have experienced traumatic events, these micro-traumas. Right? We often think of trauma as being uh, associated with you know, combat veterans and people who have experienced abuse, and, and those are very real big T traumas. But there's also these little traumas, right? These experiences. Uh, we have a very narrow range of acceptable behavior and ways of being in our culture, right? And when we're little and we're growing up, when we step outside of that, it may be a very authentic expression of ourselves, we get taught real quickly, nope, that's not acceptable. Nope, boys don't cry. Nope, you know, girls, you gotta be this pretty. Whatever it might be, there's all these messages. There's little ouches, right? Little experiences of pain and fear, and they get locked in the body, and it forms, it begins to form our ego identity. So we carry that around in our body. I like this image being weighed down, right? I think of our spirit as being weighted by these traumas. So shadow work, the first step. Shadow is that which we hide, repress, or deny. Right? It's those parts that are difficult to look at or that we're just unconscious to. We don't know they're there. Projected shadow is the cause of almost all conflict, says Carl Jung, who coined shadow work to begin with. 
right? So we have these unconscious aspects of our personality that we project onto others, right? I think of shadow as what we read in between the lines. You know, we think we know what somebody else's motivation is. Oh, I know why you did that. So often we're projecting our own internal stuff onto those people, right? And it creates conflict and communities fall apart, right? Relations get, ships get sabotaged. And these shadows often, and we end up working with limiting self-beliefs, right? These beliefs about myself that were developed because of these traumatic experiences and all these things that are stored in my body, and I start to believe that I'm not good enough. Right? That I don't have what it takes, that I'm not lovable. And if somewhere deep down I believe I'm not lovable, how the hell am I going to accept love from anybody, let alone myself, right? So it's so important to identify these things and be able to bring some healing into them. Again, making the unconscious conscious. And there's various windows into one's shadow, right? They may be unconscious, but that doesn't mean they have to remain there. One of the ways that we... Uh, dive into our unconscious and our inner dynamics is through examining our projections. So uh, there's, there's a note card and a pen underneath your seat. So I'm going to do a little process here. I'm going to invite you to uh, pull those out. Uh, folks in the back, I don't know how to have any, but they're, uh, Michael, you want to grab those and just set them up for today at least. So on one side of the card, I invite you to think of somebody and write down the name of somebody that you respect very much. Maybe a public figure, a historical figure, a member of your family or community. But who's that person you have profound respect for? once you have that person, write three words that characterize that person best. And really try to get to the essence of what it is you respect about that person. What are those qualities that you really admire? And once you've got those, turn your card over. And write down the name of somebody that you don't respect. Somebody that you have real problems with. Could be a public figure. <laughs> I'm not going to suggest anybody in particular, but I know who y'all are writing down. No. Um, <laughs> but again, it can, it can be anybody. And under that person's name, Write the three defining characteristics that you have a real problem with. Great. So take a look. These are your judgments about these people. Somebody else might have completely different judgments, right? This is the way you see them. This is looking through your perspective, your lens. These are your projections. So those positive characteristics, how do they apply to you in your life? How do you embody those things? And on the other side, those characteristics you have a hard time with. How do you embody those in your life? Or in your past? Maybe in a particular relationship, that's how you show up. So we, so we investigate these things, we see where it lands, 
We see what may be associated with this. Sometimes there's guilt, shame. Spaces that need healing. And the work is to dive in and bring some light and healing. Okay? So now the person is on the medicine. Thank you, by the way, for indulging me and participating in that so well. So I appreciate it a lot. So now we move into the mindfulness. The person now takes the medicine, right? Again, we do this very ceremoniously in a really mindful way. And a person lays back, and they usually have a blindfold on. And we start with a really deep body scan. Those cards are for you to keep, by the way. <laughs> Sit with those for a little while. Um, we do a really deep body scan, right? Really get a person relaxed, starting from the toes, working all the way up to the top of the head, and relaxing every part of the body. Then we, some of these points, right, these things that have been in shadow, we dive into and find where the tension appears, right? I think about something, some aspect of myself that needs healing, that needs growth. Where does the tension show up? This is very muscular, right? It's very somatic work. And we bring our mindful attention and focus onto that thing. And when you're in this altered state, those sensations, those tensions, feel like they're high definition, right? You can feel all the contours of it. People say that it feels almost like icebergs, right? Stuck in their body. We shine the light of our attention on it. And we breathe, breathe, right? We bring in breathe, these deep diaphragmatic breaths in order to, right, which activates the vagus nerve, which activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which says it's time to relax and rest and digest. I am safe. And those icebergs begin to melt and they begin to break up. And it's a, it's a, can be a crazy experience at times because oftentimes lots of memories come up, you kind of burn through them. People have really profound visual experiences at times. Sometimes there's big outbursts of emotion. But we're releasing, releasing the trauma from the body. So this is, if that's where the tension is, right there in the lower back, we're really gonna focus on that. We're gonna feel all the shape and contour of it. And we're gonna breathe into it, we're gonna relax it. And we release. So this is where the somatic trauma relief comes in, release. This is uh, primarily based on uh, Peter Levine's work. This is a book of his, I highly recommend it. He's written a couple other books and there's a lot of articles out there. You can look up somatic experiencing. Highly recommend it. Very accessible as well. He's a really uh, easy uh, writer to read. So the way, so trauma works, right? We have an activation of the sympathetic nervous system. We go into fight or flight. We experience some fear, right? Some uh, uh, the traumatic event, right? We're told don't be this way, be that way, whatever it might be. We're shamed for something. It activates our nervous system. And when we go into fight or flight. Right? Our body gauge, gauges itself and it's ready to fight against or it's ready to take off. But so often, we don't have the opportunity to do those things. We don't have the, it's not appropriate to fight back. It's not appropriate to run out the door when your boss says something to you that didn't feel very good and went straight to your heart, right? So we tense up and then the tension is stored in the body. And, uh, so Peter Levine and his colleagues did a bu have done lots of research, right? That uh, in, in all kinds of different mammals, and when, uh, particularly like when a prey animal is fleeing from, the pr from a predator and then it escapes, right? Uh, this could be a profoundly traumatic event, but they don't experience trauma. And what happens is they shake it out. They physically release it from their body. They twitch, they shake. You can watch these videos online. It's kind of crazy at times. 
um, but they're releasing all that excess energy that was pumped into their system. So when we're in these altered states, right, a person is doing this mindful work, they're deep under the influence of the medicine, they begin to focus on these points of tension, and, they, and often these involuntary movements happen. There's shaking, twitching, trembling. It's very normal, very natural. It, it, it can freak people out a little bit at times. But it, it's the body releasing, right? So why do this work, though? Right? So we're releasing trauma. Why? Oh, OK, great. What are the implications? So if we go back to this hero's journey perspective, right, where we're coming from and where we're going to, we go from being weighed down by all these different traumas that get stored in our body, and we get to shine. We get to integrate and live more fully into our empowered, authentic self-states. And the work of integration has begun, right? For me, it's really important to look at the big picture, right? Where does this fit into our current cultural dynamic, et cetera? Why do this work? Again, what implications does this have for culture? Right? The way I look at it, we're in trouble. Right? There's all kinds of pollution and species that are dying. There's this uh, research study that just came out that says that uh, species are declining at such an intense rate, what they're calling it the sixth mass extinction, and it is far, uh, it's far more accelerated than we previously imagined. Even species that haven't been on the endangered species list, numbers are decreased by 30% in some cases and their range, right, is, is disappearing as well. War, right, there's wars raging right now, and we're constantly live under the fear of even larger scale wars. So this is the call to me, right? By the way, just a personal note, the story of this elephant, I was, my parents are here, I'm gonna embarrass my dad for a second. Uh, we were talking about climate change and some of the problems that are going on with the planet, and we were driving, and, and he had heard this thing about the elephants and the rates at which elephants are disappearing. And he paused, and he looked over at me, and there were tears in his eyes. He said, I don't know if I want to live in a world without elephants. Yeah, me either. There's work to be done. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. We've got all kinds of problems we're in right now. So we need to change, we need to elevate our consciousness, right? We need to elevate the, the way we vibrate. We need to release the trauma and step into our more empowered selves. Right? And when we're not caked down by all the trauma, we're not projecting it onto others, and we're engaging in a healthy, authentic, beautiful way, we get to connect more with others. We're building that human family. And we get to integrate into, into the earth, right? our, our rightful place, our sense of belonging. This is kind of the way I look at it paradigm-wise, right? There's kind of like an, I, I think of it as an old model and a new model. In the old model, and this is particularly like Western civilization, right? Culture as, as uh, influenced by uh, the Abrahamic religious, religions in particular. There's this kind of transcendent deity up above, then there's humanity and earth, and humanity's right in between, right? We're like not, we're, we're, we're greater than the earth, but we're less than God, we're right there in the middle. And so it's like a, there's an inherent dualism there. There's an there's a other than perspective, and this leads to a commodification of people and planet. Right? We take advantage of things because we don't identify with them. 
The new model starts, right, it's an emergent perspective. It starts, you know, with a Big Bang origin, and then there's the conglomeration of stars and planets and evolution, and there's the emergence of consciousness on this planet, right? And it creates a space for an, for an identification with the Earth. We are Earth stuff. We are made of Earth and star stuff. It's an ecological perspective. It sees the interwoven connectivity and, and interdependence of all things, right? It's unitive. It's unitive. And I think there's space within this model for, uh, for spiritual religious perspectives, right? This doesn't negate God or divinity or the universe, whatever you want to look at it, right? There, even uh, in Genesis, right, the man was created out of, out of the dust of the earth, earth stuff, right? But it's, it's about uh, this emergent perspective. So I see it as our culture being on this hero's journey from an old way of being into a new way of being that's more integrated. And down here in the ordeal, what our culture needs to do, it requires individuals willing to do their own work, willing to do the challenging work of healing, of transformation, and empowering themselves. There's cultural shadow, right? I think of the United States. We have a very specific American brand, right? Freedom, liberty, we're the best country. But what happens when we buy into that? We push into shadow anything that may challenge that belief. So all the injustices, right? The inequality, we, we don't look at it. That work needs to be done here. And that's what happens when each of us is willing to take a good hard look at our own lives in ways that we're buying into these, uh, these cultural shadows. So a few resources, right? Because people are doing healing work all over the place. And I want to share some of them with you that have been profoundly uh, impactful in my life. Medicinal mindfulness. This is Daniel McQueen. He's an amazing man extremely humble uh, and, and, and very inspiring. His organization is called Medicinal Mindfulness. Again, uh, as Ashley, Ashley mentioned earlier, he'll be here in August the 17th. He's giving a talk, Manifesting Visions, Extended State DMT, and Trans Cannabis Research. You're all invited to come. Check out his website, medicinalmindfulness.com. There, uh, there's probably the best guided body scan meditation I've ever found. So those of you who want to use cannabis and do some mindfulness work and, and engage in some of these techniques, these practices, I highly recommend going to his resource page and finding the recordings. And I'm a bit of a like, YouTube guided meditation junkie, so uh, this, is, this is, I speak from experience that this is good stuff. Uh, the Mankind Project. This has probably uh, been the, the most deeply, profoundly transformational work I've been engaged in, right? Then my medicine work added to that uh, in the last few years has just accelerated uh, my personal process. The Mankind Project is an international organization of men doing uh, deep transformational work, shadow work. And they build powerful community and containers in which to do that. There's two sister organizations, Her and Women Within, uh, for, for women who want to do this work. Vipassana Center, this is meditation oriented. Uh, this is an amazing organization. It's completely volunteer and donation based. Right, so uh, it's a 10 day silent retreat and they don't even accept any of your money and donations until after you've completed the 10 days. So it's like you go through it and you appreciate it then give a little bit. But that'll, that'll jumpstart your meditative practice. So final thought, my uh, MKB family knows this quote well. This quote is attributed to Margaret Mead. Never doubt, 
that a thoughtful group of committed citizens can change the world, for indeed, it is the only thing that ever happened. Right? It takes us coming together and doing our work in community in order to make the changes that we need to see in the world. And I invite you, those of you who are interested in experiencing some deeply uh, transformational journeys with East of Cannabis, to give it a shot. See what you find there. Big thank you to Ashley again, and, and the entire uh, WEAR Project crew, Malia. Thank you so much for everything. Uh, I want to thank my family and friends for being here. Michael, my partner, he wouldn't have been able to do this without you. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. It's been a pleasure to share. So we have some time for a few questions, if anybody uh, has a thought or two they'd like to share, ask about. Yeah? What kind of strings do you usually use? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So uh, use a blend. Repeat uh, the question. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> he asked, what strains do we use, right? We're using flour. So we use a blend of indica and sativa. Right, so, uh, and, and it's really important, for me it's really important to blend those two. The sativa, and we're using some, you know, some top shelf uh, powerful stuff, uh, really creates the insight and visuals that people have, right, the connectivity, you know, uh, the creativity uh, aspect of the experience, and the indica really helps get in the body really accelerates this somatic work, right? And there's, there's a lot of research coming out right now about the different terpenes, right, that are present in the plant and how they affect the, the type of high, and that's actually where it's rooted. So I'm using kind of uh, a, uh, just like the common layman's term of there being like a mental, uh, like a, high, a head high and a body high. But it, it, it breaks down that way pretty well. But yeah, thank you. Give it a shot. Yeah. Have you found that there is a, I would say, greater effect on sitters who do not use cannabis as part of their daily routine? Mm. Yes. Yes. Right? People who use cannabis uh, daily or regularly um, will be the ones who are taking the seven hits. Right? Those who rarely use it probably are good with four or five because it's, it, it, it's powerful. They don't need to take that money. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, he asked if uh, this process is Daniel McQueen's or mine or a hybrid, right? Um, this is, uh, this is, I take a lot from Daniel, right? The somatic experiencing of it, the kind of the form and structure of it and the way, you know, I guide somebody through it. I really have integrated shadow work in a, in a, in a more intentional way because that's been my background and the work that I've done and I've found so much uh, uh, healing and growth from that. So I, I really found it important to integrate that. But he definitely uses the somatic work, the mindfulness practices, yeah. Here and here. Why is it that you choose to smoke rather than ingest the cannabis? Uh, so by using edibles, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Instead of, yeah, gotcha. Um, First of all, the edible takes a lot longer to set in, typically, right? The, when we have a person smoke, it's, the effect is pretty immediate. Uh, and also, there's usually a little more uh, control in that if a person, again, if they have four and they know they're done, whoa, they're already kind of blasting off, they can stop. With the edible, it's like, you know, a person might uh, go way further and deeper than they, than they want, to, want to go or not ready for yet. Yeah, thank you. Over here? Hi. Um, do you 
When in your work, do you usually smoke with them, like the same amount, mm. um, and or do you not do it if they do it? Yeah, um, most of the time I don't do it. Every now and then, uh, depending on the time of day and what the rest of my schedule looks like, uh, I will because, but just a little bit, like one hit to help, uh, it helps kind of get me in the same field, right? In that same energetic space and really kind of resonate with them and maybe a deeper level. And because the sitter um, has a profound responsibility of uh, energetically holding space and being mindful of their own process and clearing and breathing through things as they come up, right? I become like the healthy nervous system that holds space for somebody else while they're going through maybe a very intense experience. So I stay really grounded and create that energetic container. Uh, so I don't want to be blasting off. I don't want to be in a space where I can't be really present. So maybe one hit. Yeah, thanks. Right here. Back here in the middle. Would you recommend to work for somebody who is already abusing Mariana or mm -hmm. is as a bad results after he uses it? Yeah. Thank you. Daniel talks about this a lot, actually. When people begin to work with the, the medicine in a really intentional way this way, often their relationship with the plant begins to shift. And they begin to treat it with more reverence and more respect. And, I don't, and, 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 and by saying that, though, I don't want to send the message that people who do use regularly, that it's, that it's a bad thing, right? Sometimes it's, it's, it's a beautiful assist for people who are do, dealing with difficult times, right? And yes, people can become over-reliant on it, I believe. Um, so th th there's, you know, there's some uh, evidence developing that as people's relationship changes with the plant, uh, they shift their usage. And also, sometimes when you're using it uh, in this way, these really mindful ways, uh, you may find that in your more recreational use, it'll drop you into a deeper space more quickly. Um, which is, so, so those who are regular users are maybe dropping into a really deep space that they hadn't intended, and so they tend to lighten up their, their level of use. Yeah, thank you. We have time for one more question. One more. Oh, would, you be, would you be willing to share with us a success story of where you saw, where you processed this? something, or where it actually had a shift, or where it had an impact? Yeah, yeah, great, good question. Um, one of the first clients that I worked with in this way had this really beautiful experience, um, and I don't want to go into too much detail, it was his process, right? But um, it helped him release this, uh, this really deep piece associated with some of his early family trauma uh, that he had never been able to, to really address or look at. And then in the aftermath, he went and engaged his family and had a really beautiful, open-hearted conversation and uh, really started to change the dynamic that they had in their, in their family and their relationship. Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so at these AWARE Project events, we like to end with a piece of, of, of art, right? Something to engage the heart, uh, right? Engage, I just engaged your mind and gave you a bunch of information. And I have a dear friend and brother and just a really beautiful soul, uh, Mike Mejia, who is here to share some of his work. And uh, his poetry is profoundly beautiful to me. Uh, and resonates on a really deep level, so I really hope you enjoy. Uh, Mike, I welcome you up. Hi. Uh, I first want to thank uh, the AWARE Project and Preston for uh, inviting me to be here tonight. And that was a brilliant conversation. I mean, you're articulate and charismatic and illuminated the room. And, uh, all of my shadows are aligned right now. <laughs> yeah, I did just, I feel them in my knee. So, uh, no, but you did a great job. And uh, we got together last week and we picked the two pieces I'm going to share tonight. And this first one's about 
um, changing the stigma of what it means to have darkness inside of us. Because when we start to understand that, that uh, darkness is uh, a gift, then we get to kind of start using it as a tool to become centered again. This first one's called The Black Raven. Whatever lessons have been overlooked, it is time for them to be met again. Wherever I look at another and fail to see God, I know that I must look again. When the darkness of what lives inside of me shows itself, I will not hide this time, for in this act I have lost balance. Everything that I have experienced has a life of its own, and when I honor its life, experiences open the heart and open the eyes. Everything that we have been through, all the people who left a mark in our hearts, all that you have seen, and all that you conclude you are, let go of, dance with your pain, enunciate the ache in your heart, and confess that you live with a voice in your head that has disfigured your mind. Utter the words, I do not know why I am here. Utter them without fear, for this will become your first prayer. Free yourself from the dichotomy of separation, revere the dark, and in this you will witness a synthesis, the way the stars cast light on the night, bringing its story to life, the way the heart of the ocean rests in the black of the blue, the way the raven of the slave rose from the ashes of a white grave, and the way a thousand souls died in the closet, silenced, now free, breathing and speaking through me. Thank you. And uh, this final piece is called Breathe. And uh, I like to think of the breath as a bridge from this dreamlike state into eternity. And so the concept was breathing through all that energies, uh, all the affliction, and all the static until we breathe into everness. I've replaced belief with the experience of living. Both Grace and I had met at the top of the mountain, and it was there, through the soul, that an endlessness would birth an eternal knowing. My relationship with the unknown would melt the pain felt and carried by the young boy who once was cast at the center of the sea, chained by fear into a methodical dance where both eternity and I would fade back into one. So why wait for a symphony to lead you into the sky when you can become the music that breathes new life? For the resurrection of truth is to become you. It is there that you shall become the stars, become the poem, and as they read you walk through life, know that you hold the key to a deathless life. Now, become the night. Breathe as the night. Breathe until you become the light of day. Breathe hope into the heart that has become an abscess to the body and an abyss for the dark. Breathe and face yourself. Allow yourself to feel the depth of pain that lives inside of you. Breathe until you no longer fear death. Breathe until both death and life become a myth, a story actualizing itself through the narration of immeasurability. Breathe until you feel the echo of the unending pulse descend back into being. Breathe until the only thing that is left is love. Thank you. Thank you both so much.
much for your beautiful offerings to this community. It's such an honor to be sharing the stage with, with you guys. <laughs>